Cyberpunk 2077 is a wasted opportunity, and God, that fucking hurts to say. Now, here's the point early in a long video essay where I give you a fair warning, because I'm a good guy. If you haven't played the game yet and you plan on it or want to after, you know, they patch it out in a year to where it's decently playable, the story is one of the only factors redeeming enough to keep me coming back to eventually beat the game a few times. So, uh, yeah, spoiler warning. I don't recommend spoiling this game for yourself, especially just to listen to a pre-diabetic smurf, that joke will make more sense later, simp over a video game girl who likes guns and also cars. With that said, let's get into the shit show, bitches. Uh, sorry for calling you a bitch back there, I got a little too worked up and you know, th that's on me. But uh, Cyberpunk 20 fucking 77. 20 probably because you've already watched 20 videos on the dumpster fire, fucking because you can have sex and also see tits in the game, and 77 because it's been about 77 months since the first ever fucking teaser trailer dropped for the damn thing. But we're gonna talk about that in just a second. <laughs> If any entertainment product that's existed in my lifetime, especially on the internet, needed absolutely no introduction, it would be Star Wars. And then if Star Wars didn't exist, it would probably be Pokemon. But somewhere in the top five, top 10 is Cyberpunk 2077. From a tabletop game that came out when my parents were still being taught that global warming was a Darwinist lie meant to smite God, to a teaser trailer that came out when I was a freshman failing environmental science, to a 50 person team dedicated to pre production, to $8 million of Polish government subsidies, to an additional new studio meant to aid production, to a 48 minute gameplay trailer, to years of delays, to a 60 gig day one patch, to installation problems and steam crashes that almost broke Critical's 26 year streak of talking in precisely one tone, Cyberpunk 2077 will go down as the absolute best PMV POV joy edging denial humiliation blue ball striptease in internet history and god damn it, that's a saturated market, baby. And that's why I think before we get into what I have to say and what I feel and, and my review of the game, and trust me, there's a lot of it, I think we should go over a bit of the production history, marketing, teaser content, celebrity endorsements, in-house content for YouTube, all of the stuff that coalesced into one of the biggest hype bubbles in entertainment history. Because at this point, cyberpunk exists outside of itself on the internet, and I think it needs to be reviewed relative to that. So, slam back a few shots, pop a couple glizzies on the grill, pull up your favorite chair and get comfy, and let's see if Cyberpunk even stood a chance of living up to its father's expectations. January 2013, in the news right now is Lance Armstrong admitting to being a career dope, which I don't know why anyone cares about his academic career to begin with. Mark Rober is probably shitting his pants because we found out that the Curiosity Rover found milk on Mars, and rumblings of a game too amazing to even imagine start to emerge after a mysterious trailer drops on YouTube.com. The original teaser trailer for Cyberpunk 2077 is literally just 3D concept art that could probably pass for a hentai bumper ad on the hub that's overlaid with some pretty sick and also epic gunshot animations accompanied by a description packed to the brim with contextless lore and information that will kick off the destructive marketing approach that will define the cyberpunk culture for the next seven years. That same year, 2013, the game was announced for Microsoft Windows and then... Silence. Five years without utterance, without a millisecond of footage, without a single word to tide over hope that the game still exists. And then, like a bat out of hell at E3 2018, 65 months later, we see Night City in all its glory, set to music that could make even my flaccid baby dick seem badass. And even, even though it was preceded by Phil Spencer giving some half-hearted spiel about how Xbox will always give you the goopiest gamer guck job, and followed up by one of the weakest E3 crowd reactions I've ever heard, Cyberpunk showed gamers watching around the world that she wasn't like the other girls. And she also brought fans to actual tears who had waited a third or fourth of their life for confirmation that their favorite big titty goth bitch still exists. As we immediately started clambering for any information on how to become this goth girl, 
girl's money pigs. We heard rumors that were disturbing. Certain media at E3 2018 were giving access to 48 minutes of her pre-alpha OnlyFans content. And after two more months of silent chastity, gamers were finally let loose at Gamescom to games come all over 48 minutes and 23 seconds of heavenly gamer smut. Apparently, I loved the pre-alpha display so much that I accidentally spent a month making an analysis video on it that's really bad and cringy. You could have analyzed that demo for the next two years if you wanted to, and I'm sure some people have. But to me, it was immediately clear what the most important thing they were showing us was. And that was whatever inconsequential mission they were playing through came with multiple junctions of choice and opportunity, and the ramifications of the choices you made were obvious and distinct as you progressed through the mission. True choice, the ability to impact the world around you and your character's own destiny. Something we've been promised in just about every RPG game for decades, put on live display right before our very eyes. And from there on, Cyberpunk was a gamer's household name. However, at the end of Microsoft's 2019 E3 showcase, you could drop the gamer from that phrase because dads around the world sat up slightly in their lazy boys at the sight of none other than Keanu Reeves in all his digitized glory. With Keanu Reeves came a riveting cinematic that is 10 times cooler than what actually happens in the game, the reveal of a weapon that is virtually impossible to have at the point in the story they are showing, as well as one of modern gaming's most iconic badass moments that doesn't actually happen in the game for some reason. Cap that off with a worldwide release date of this April and an announcement that uh, pre-orders were now open, which resulted in Cyberpunk becoming the best-selling game on Steam immediately and outdoing The Witcher 3's total pre-orders in just about three days. And uh, you had a hype train beyond capacity barreling toward its destination. Over the next seven months, CDPR would host cosplay contests, computer case modding contests, release songs from the OST, as well as an inside look at production hours of interview with dev leads, and announce another celebrity name attached to the game, Grimes. Further perpetuating the self-induced cock and ball torture that gamers were subjecting themselves to in preparation for their and the game's big release. And like a middle-aged woman dressed in latex from head to toe, CDPR spanked us with a delay and pushed the game back just about five months, also coming with a statement that, uh, no, the, the game's ready to ship, you stupid idiot. But, uh, they just wanted to make sure, and bring it in close for this one, you want to hear this, that, uh, Cyberpunk 2077 was the crowning jewel of this generation. Yeah, that's me. I guess you're wondering how I got here, right? Well, uh, I, I kind of misspoke a little bit, and I, I want to be more clear because I care about my integrity. The actual quote from CD Projekt Red is, we want Cyberpunk 2077 to be our crowning achievement for this generation, and postponing launch will give us the precious months we need to make the game perfect. This generation specifically referencing the PS4, Xbox One generation of consoles, and uh, knowing what we know now about the game's release, and specifically how it plays on that generation of consoles, uh, yeah, I think the sentiment here still holds up. Months later, with COVID in full swing now and studios working from home, the localization and debugging processes were slowed significantly, to the point where in June the game was delayed again until November. Ah, oh, but don't worry, the marketing department cooked us up another trailer that was probably meant to run at E3 2020, ripped to a real one, and this trailer cuts together what I now know to be loads of footage that doesn't correspond accurately whatsoever to a very nice and poignant monologue being delivered by V and Jackie. IMHO, this trailer kind of just makes the prologue seem a lot more high stakes and off rails than we all now know it to be, and also just further fucking spoils the first four to five hours of gameplay and story. For the next few months, advertising really ramps up. All of the now iconicized 30 second unskippables of Keanu Reeves take over YouTube, tons of behind the scenes content starts rolling out, and all types of videos, articles, and podcasts flooded to the internet by CDPR further spoil and cherry pick all the cool shit in the game. And all of this material, especially anything to do with Keanu Reeves, who really seems to love his role and character in the game, centers around two things, choice and individuality. Then coming right on the toes of a tweet from the official CDPR Twitter saying that take off from work, that's how sure we are the game is coming out on November 19th, comes the last delay until December 10th, highlighting an obviously frayed line of communication between 
the multiple departments at CDPR, as well as what can only be described as either incompetent oversight or sneaky underhanded upper management. Either way, we're gonna discuss that at length later on in the video. Eight years of work, promotional content, including entire missions advocating for pure choice and identity, cherry-picked and manipulated trailers, someone with the near flawless record of Keanu Reeves genuinely co-signing the concept and objective of the studio, dev leads putting things out into the world like crowning jewel of the generation and wanting to take and build on the success of Red Dead 2. And might as well throw the resurrection of my great grandma as Gamer Girl Supreme on there too. All coalescing into unimaginable expectations, un unattainable expectations for sure, but entirely founded expectations accidentally kicked off by an overzealous, loving, trustworthy studio and exacerbated by their ever-growing greedy corpo overlords. That is the story of Cyberpunk 2077 pre-launch and now that we understand the stakes of this game and the paths taken to get there, I just finished downloading a broken day one patch from a crashing steam page and I want to slap around some fucking goth gamer girl big ass nipples or some shit. Let's do it. Gungo style. Is that Dwayne Johnson? <laughs> it's a good thing you were hey. I could probably use your help. What is going on? What the fuck? What the hell is happening? Oh no, we're in the Harry Potter cast. Dude, what the <laughs> fuck? Jesus Christ. What the fuck is wrong with Cyberpunk? Why? Why? <laughs> now playing, betrayed by the game by Dance Gavin Dance. <laughs> Up until December 10th of 2020, I'd never had any experience with a single CDPR game. Unless you, of course, count my little 30-minute stint with the uh, game where you play as sexy Gandalf and you're, you're on KY Jelly ice skates the whole time. I preface with that just to let you know that I have no reason to love, hate, defend, lambast, or go to battle for CD Projekt Red. With that said, if you're a writer, developer, artist, coder, actor, musician, designer, anyone who brought this game to life with your arthritic hands and ADHD creative brains, I commend you, admire you, and at this point feel pretty fucking sorry for you. However, if you're a corpo over at CDPR, suck my disproportionately large balls and miniature cock. And with that said, what the fuck? Why'd you guys do this? When I first finished the cyberpunk campaign, I thought it was reminiscent of the, the dumb puppy that can't help but break, chew, or defile everything in its wake. But at the end of the day, when you cuddle up next to him in bed, you know it's all worth it. Unless he's still defiled. But now that I have no story incentive to hang my hat on, I've kind of realized it's way more reminiscent of my personal experience with amateur porn. I really enjoy looking at it, even if it can get a, a bit repetitive. The story is uniquely refreshing at best, and at least intriguing at its worst. I can see what the creators and performers are trying to do, even if they're not accomplishing it. It's not worth full price. I 
I feel shameful when I finish with it, and uh, someone on the production team definitely jerked off to it. And I don't think I would go out of my way to personally recommend it to anyone. My biggest gripe with the game by far is how much heart it has. Which makes no sense unless I follow that statement up with another statement that says I played this game for 75 or 80 hours and I beat it twice and I can confidently say I want to hate it. It deserves to be hated. But as the Beatles 2 said, you can't always get what you want. And I want to hate it, but I can't fully. CDPR held up some of their promises and there's so much that this game gets right, except most of the core aspects of video games. Before we really rip into the game systems, oversights, and blatant lies that have somewhat soured my feelings towards cyberpunk, I also want to go over some of the things that made my heart do a cat daddy. Now this may be commonplace or mundane for some of you, but the fact that where I look interacts with the dialogue options I have at the moment kind of just like blows my apron to the moon. Also the game like totally perfected time sensitive dialogue options and its relationship to tension which completely drives your immersion in the lower more story driven points of the game. Also this game does tangential dialogue better than any game out there. You know like the dialogue like tidbits and questions you don't need to ask but Pan Am is my girlfriend now and I want to be a good boyfriend so. Faces and expressions are about as consistently good as I've ever seen in a game you know w w when they decide to show up to work for the day. Voice acting is top fucking notch. Shout out to Jason Hightower everybody's favorite Chumba. And to Michael Gregory who voices my dad in the game and not yours. And of course all of these guys amongst many others but Carla Tassara the VA for Judy. Live news broadcasts and loading screens actively reporting on the things that you do and how they impact Night City or the things that are about to come to pass that will impact you. It's just such a nice little reach around for the boys. And there's probably more but for the sake of time lastly they didn't have to have a live animated widget for the people you're talking to on the phone. They could have just done that like you know fucking possessed spaghetti voice wave bullshit but they didn't and I appreciate that. Cyberpunk's policing system is almost as fucked as the one we have in real life, and oof, talk about competition. I've always been of the belief that the police or guard mechanics in the games that we play are a lot more integral than we give them credit for, especially because the impact they have isn't entirely palpable, unless you look a little deeper. But we're not gonna do that because sometimes it's also pretty fucking obvious. Like, half the fun I had in GTA V was just getting five stars and reenacting the final mission of Halo Reach. <laughs> Any good sandbox RPG worth its prepubescent glass needs a solid consequence system. And Cyberpunk has a consequence system. The doozy is though that word solid I just said. You want it to be good because if not, it's bad. Now, since CDPR was trying to mimic the very well received and polished release of Red Dead Redemption 2, I thought who better to compare their consequence system against than Rockstar. I'd argue that Cyberpunk is pretty damn similar to GTA 5 on a lot of fronts, except maybe questing, writing, and the ability to customize your player's cock and balls, which seems a little bit more reasonable for a GTA game anyway. Don't know if this is how you say his name, but Crobecat put out a wonderful video where he doesn't even need to speak to shine an astral fucking spotlight on the shortcomings of the cyberpunk police and NPC population in comparison to cornerstone games like GTA or Lego City Undercover. It highlights the NCPD's literal inability to problem solve, critically think, fucking pursue you, exist for more than one second before you've committed a crime. And their predisposed inability to de-escalate the situation or just not shoot you on contact, which I know is really realistic, but I don't know, I don't really like getting Sonny Corleone'd every time I jump up and down next to a police officer. But more than all of that technical nerd shit, the NCPD, it's just not fucking fun at all. Fighting off swarms of LSPD that you couldn't quite handle earlier in the game, but now with all the guns you've grinded to get access to, it's a breeze. Fun. Being too weak to ever, ever have a competent fight with the NCPD, even by the end of the game. Shit. Taking out LSPD helicopters with RPGs. Fun. Constantly being antagonized by 343 Goofy Shark while you're trying to fight the fucking NCPD. Piss. Leading the LSPD on a supercar chase across Los Santos, avoiding dynamic roadblocks, nail strips, SWAT teams, and fucking choppers. 
fun. The NCPD not being able to pursue you at all. Not that they're too slow or bad or stupid or you're so epic. Or, they aren't coded to be able to pursue you. Fuck. The LSPD or just a branch of the GTA Consequence system having a military base that's only accessible by Ron from Harry Potter and the Chamber of Secrets specifically. And once you get in there, if you can make it in there, you get a jet and a tank to do whatever you want with. But there's AIs that are fucking coded to be able to chase you in tanks and jets. Fun. Oh, uh, the NCPD having just one police. They just, the, the one type of police and the 343 Guti Shar and that's it. Except it, except if the game senses you having too much fun, they have the I'm already Tracer Robocop and he, you can't kill him, but he kills you. Cunt. The LSPD, those, those boys uh, spawning blocks away and having a live map module so you know where they are and where they're coming from and which way they're facing. So if you want to, you can avoid them. Fun. Hostile NCPD officers spawning right behind you no matter where you are, what you're doing, or what precautions you took not to get caught. And when they show up, they notify you with a cranial stun grenade of screeching ear rape. Cocksucker. Motherfucker. Tits. And that's my seven things a consequence system in a game should never be composed of. If you notice, the last three curse words or complaints are all the same thing. The uh, cop spawning right behind you no matter where you're going, what you're doing, or what precautions you took for them to not do that thing. And that's because that feature, or lack thereof, is the worst thing in the game and contributes the most to the problem I have with the entire system. For one, it's the most limiting, unfun, soul-crushing thing I've experienced in a game in a hot minute. For two, for, for second, has anyone ever done a for two before? Why, did, why does that sound so stupid? For two, it's absolutely devastating for immersion. To have every decision that you make second-guessed and punished just absolutely destroys any illusion of choice or freedom you thought you had. And for third, it doesn't make narrative sense at all. It actually, it probably makes the opposite of sense. I don't know what that is. I'm a little drunk right now. Bedroom. Boy, take it away. And CDPR could have easily made it make narrative sense. Literally, off the top of my head, just fucking say everybody has trauma chips in their body and the police can materialize because it's the future. And if people are in danger, they fucking show up. Mechanically, that fucking sucks. And in regards to gameplay, that's still really stupid. But at least in the world, it makes like an ounce of sense. And that little bit of context that would at least take a tiny bit of the edge off of how stupid the system is as it sits right now comes at the cost of like a fucking two minute cutscene and a little bit of further explanation throughout the story. But not only does the system as it exists now suck chinchilla dick, but at the beginning of the game, we literally all see in an on rails car ride, the NCPD swoop down in a flying fucking car and annihilate people for doing way less than whatever we're gonna do in the future. And what was the point of that? We never see that happen again throughout the game. How did no one think that bringing that to fruition as the way that futuristic cops can respond in a reasonable amount of time on a sliding scale of severity, how did no one think that that was the way we should do it? If I had to levy a guess, it would be that there was no thought. And not because no one wanted to think, because there was no time to. There was only crunch and the singular direction that the game needed a consequence system. And for a fucking looming and ambiguous launch date. As it is now, in practice, the NCPD can only be compared to one other consequence system, and that is Skyrim's. And mind you, Skyrim is a game that came out when I was still watching Skin of Max at 2 a.m. because I didn't know porn existed. And it's also a game that barely needs a consequence system to begin with, in my opinion, and one that the player almost never interfaces with, yet it does a better job and is more contextually relevant to its setting than Cyberpunk's, a game which I think needed the most sophisticated one to date. Skyrim's guards patrol their cities, and when a crime is committed, charge up to you or wait for you to leave a building. When they get up to you, they'll prompt a dialogue option, letting you, the, the player of the game, decide how you want the encounter to go and if they don't it's probably because you're an active threat and if you sheathe your weapons most of the time they will if you decide to continue fighting you die because they're pretty strong or you retain a bounty in the city that at some point needs to be dealt with but you can avoid all of this if your crime is committed out of eyesight or earshot of any guards and you kill all of the witnesses the NCPD, however try and turn you into their favorite bacteria ripened hard cheese for jumping up and down next to them they won't engage you or stop trying to murder you and when you get 
away from their bloodlust. They literally cannot pursue you. And in four seconds, you can come back around the corner and they've forgotten who you are. Uh, now, you might be saying, James, those systems don't sound very similar at all. And I would say, first, shut the fuck up. I'm trying to film a video. And I would say, uh, second, what the point I'm trying to get at is they're both preventative systems. They don't serve the gameplay or the character's agency. They aren't intuitive. They aren't dynamically reactive. They aren't progressive. They're there to keep you on rails and manage your character's morality into a box and be some kind of abstract punishment for doing things the game doesn't want done. From what I've seen, the system and its functionality is kind of similar to The Witcher 3's in the sense that th there's guards in certain places that keep you from killing, stealing, or doing anything unwitcher like And answer me this, should a predisposed linear third-person RPG have the same consequence system as a, a player-created first-person sandbox? No, it, it shouldn't, but it does. Cyberpunk doesn't have a police, justice, bounty, guard, or consequence system. It literally has a don't do this or else system. It's so limiting RP-wise, it's unfun, and it fucks the post game right out of existence. Because when it's all said and done, and I finally got all this cool stuff that I've been saving for and playing the whole game for, who do I use it on? Who do I prompt to give me interesting experiences? Who do I fight? Who do I dick around with? Who do I fucking run away from and finally get to use my double jump legs that I saved the entire game for? I don't even know if a game system this big can be be fixed post-launch with, with patches, especially because it deals with the AI of the game. Like, I think because of how this game launched and because of how it was rushed, the NCPD, the consequence system as a whole, will forever be fucked, even if it's just fucked less. And it sucks because I ran a poll on the channel and apparently this is all of our biggest gripe with the game. It's just genuinely so disappointing. game offers a comprehensive stealth system, my character choice has become that much easier. 10 out of 10 times, my first playthrough, my first character will always be built around stealth and some kind of stealth ranged weaponry. To me, the difference between approaching a game stealthily and going in guns blazing is like sitting down as a musician to, to improvise and write compared to just jamming through songs you already know. There's no arguing that both are fun as fuck, and jamming to songs is higher energy, less thought, and more fun, but sitting down to improvise and build and explore the unknown is so much more creatively fulfilling, it's more memorable, and it leaves those rooms for one in a million fucking chances or discoveries or memories. A brain translation, basically I want to play every game like it's a fucking Assassin's Creed, and like I said in the AC video I made last summer, I will restart a mission over and over until I clear it perfectly without even alerting anyone to my presence, because there's just something so abstractly satisfying to me about pulling off a perfect stealth run. But shame on me, because to my surprise, the stealth ended up being fucking abysmal and the on-the-fly hacking interfaced with it only can prop it up so much until it just breaks down into unfun, immersion-breaking goat piss. On a macro level, the stealth just doesn't work at all. And that's not to say you can't be stealthy. That's more so to say that you can't be detected if you don't want to be. The stealth system as it stands now kind of reminds me of playing like hide-and-seek as a five-year-old. And, you know, I'm playing with both my parents and I'm too much of an ADHD little rat to stay 
stay in one place so I'm running between them and my mom catches me and she promises not to tell my dad and lets me go on my way. And that's all gravy for a baby because if you don't give them a little bit of leeway you run the risk of them crying so hard they vomit and then shit themselves. But I like to think as a 23 year old I have a little bit more control over my emotions. Bo bodily functions is another story but. So maybe they purposely nerfed the detection system to the pathetic point it's at because if the stealth was impossible to pull off consistently they wouldn't live up to their promise of sprawling sandbox of choice and unique approach. But having AI detection so dumbed down to the point where I can literally walk up to the people as they're reacting to the realization of my presence and jump behind a box and their memory is immediately zapped. It's just as limiting, if not more so, because you're handing me my illusion of choice and then spiking it into the ground and laughing in my face. Most of the time if I slipped up and I was, you know, found out to the point where I think that I should have been discovered, I just rolled with it and acted like I was because that was the only way to balance the mechanic and get some of the stealth that I was looking for out of the game. But knowing what I know now, I honestly wish that stealth just wasn't a mechanic built into the game, so I would have known that going into it and built a character from the get-go that was better at something else. Before we move on, I want to show you a uniquely infuriating experience I had with stealth a little bit later in the game that I think really highlights the shortcomings of the system and just cyberpunk as a whole and the lack of polish that it has. This mission, this one mission, a pivotal mission in winning the heart of Pan Am, who is the end product of a Harvard social experiment researching the exact perfect mate for Gamma Dick Gamer Boys. This mission couldn't have seemed more perfect for a stealthy approach. It seemed so good, my, my penis started retracting into my body to prepare for sneakiness. This was it. This was the mission, the stealth mission I've been waiting for. Finally, the stars had aligned and Mercury was in a retro arcade. So, the mission, saving my wife's boyfriend from a heavily fortified enemy gang compound smack dab in the middle of the desert's taint. Before we head out there, I'm given a quick look through an invisible surveillance drone, and while the drone and my compatriots take me on a narrated tour of the compound I'm meant to sneak into alone and sneak out of with a hostage, I'm able to use the drone's interface to mark loot, tech, interactive objects, and what do you know? Enemies. Now this interface isn't only part of the drone, mind you. This is something you can do at any point in the game just as yourself because of your Kamo Kawa, Kawasaki eye inserts or whatever the fuck the eye mod is that every player is narrated forced to get at the very beginning of the game. So, I spend a good four or five minutes marking every single enemy I possibly can, as well as certain loot and shit I can hack once I'm inside. I'm getting excited at this point, not only because this is finally an encounter designed to promote and encourage stealth, but because I can go in with an optional upper hand that I took the time to earn that actually makes sense in the context of the world. Like, I can do all this in Assassin's Creed already, but how does it make sense to the, the context of the world and the gameplay and your character? It doesn't. You kind of just share this demagogical omnipotent Ray-Ban connection with your fucking eagle best friend, which is cool. It's fun and it still lets you get this kind of experience out of the stealth. But for some eight brain reason, the idea of doing exactly that, plus it making contextual sense to the setting of the game, I mean, it does the same job, but just really good. Anyway, I marked everything I needed to know for my extraction mission, hopped in the van with my goyle, and I headed to the compound ready to yank on some fucking unsuspecting cack and balls. And to my dismay, but certainly not my uh, surprise, the cacks in reference were all at full mast and all of my fucking marks were gone. But still, I will not be swayed. I head down there, snap a dude's neck, find that opening a door right behind someone totally stealthy. Opening it right in front of them, not very stealthy at all. Restart, because I want to do this right, and also I I don't want Pan Am to yell at me. And then I sneak through a drain. Find out that forcing open a fence made of leftover asparagus cans is a technical ability and not strength. Uh, okay. Find a cool secret storm drain entrance. Proceed to find out that kicking out an air vent cover. Also a technical ability and not strength. Okay. Um, I leave the storm drain feeling disappointed and foolish. A feeling cyberpunk has taught me well. But I'm still excited. Is this what Stockholm Syndrome feels like? I don't know. But I head back to the other side. Jump the wall. Try to stealth kill a dude with the mantis blades I spent all my fucking money on in the first third of the game. I remember they're fucking broken and have one animation they use regardless of circumstance. My sneak is broken. What? No, the music just played. My sneak isn't actually broken and no one knows I'm here. Okay, cool. Damn it, stay out of my, my goyle is yelling at me and I feel shame. I continue on into the building trying to shake off Pan Am's anger. I clear out a couple dudes, go for an aerial takedown. Remember that that's also fucking broken and uses one animation regardless of circumstance. I voice my disappointment to the ether. Why wouldn't I just like smash his head? In? How? The only limit to what you can do is what you're willing to become. Oh, 
Boxman! And after my near deadly encounter with Boxman, I head downstairs to save my wife's bull, but end up encountering some of the most goofy baby shit stealth I've ever seen. That's so stupid! Hello! <laughs> and then I rescue my wife's boyfriend, and as we try to escape, I realize that opening a pre-broken fence made of a leftover asparagus cans is also technical ability and not strength-based. So I head back out past the fucking Teletubbies watching paint dry, and walk back to my wife's fan, her boyfriend in tow, feeling irreparably disappointed, but cheered up by a little word called HABOOB. Cops, stealth, laughing titties, that's all well and good, but what about the stuff that makes a game a game? You know, gamer shit, fucking guns, fast cars, explosions, body modifications, epic quest lines, maybe some more guns, and maybe a little bit of swords too. Relationships where people actually like love you back in them, As sniper rifles, the stuff that you don't get to consistently feel in real life. Well all that stuff was, you know, actually pretty shit compared to what you marketed us for three and a half years, but Twitter had a real funny time for about, you know, 30, maybe 40 minutes on the night of release with the dick and titty slider. So, 10 out of 10, good game. Nah, but to be serious, I'm pretty disappointed with a lot of the main game systems, and not because they're like pure shit, but mostly because like sometimes they're just so fucking stand out, and other times they're pure fucking shit. Like they can really suck you in and give you a good experience like your mom. Fuck. But, you know, also it comes with a Pavlovian expectation of the thing completely breaking down, failing entirely, or just stopping short of where it's supposed to go. And that expectation is reinforced every single time. If you don't agree with me or don't believe me, that's fine. But I want to show you my personal experience with one of the pillar game systems to really convey what I mean. Driving in Night City is fucking enthralling. If you're doing it in third person, which didn't work the first week the game was out. If you're doing it in first person, you're actually uh, role-playing as a fucking dwarf with an optical obsession with the A-pillar of the car instead of the windshield. But when it works and you're in third person, you're immediately absorbed by all that's going on around you. It, it, it's really immersive. Until the AI fucking car paths break from their rails and start crashing into shit, or you start driving straight through other cars, or you watch the NCPD commit vehicular manslaughter. I quickly realized though you could avoid a lot of this BS by just driving a motorcycle, which ended up being way more fucking fun anyway. Until you realize the bike has the same physics as the lunar lander, and uh, buildings are to your bike as mountains are to a Skyrim horse. But if you just take the stick out of your ass and you ease up a little bit, you realize it's actually still a really good fucking time, even if it's a little goofy. And when you get used to it, you start seeing all the other cool little things the devs threw in, the cherries on top, the minutia. Like, when you're when you're in manual or whatever, you're switching gears, there's a clutch push and they switch the gear on the fucking bike and it lines up with the sounds and the, and the speed of the bike and everything. It's so dope. But you start to think, just for a second, why did they spend time making the clutch animation when if I go out to third person, my character standing up butt naked driving the bike with no hands. I know you saw the point I'm making a mile back down the road, but I wanted to make sure I nailed it home because I don't want to come off as the guy who wanted to hate this game to make a video about it. I do enjoy this game and I wanted it to be what it was promised to be. I wanted it to change fucking video games for me and take shit to another level. And I spent my $60 on it and I got hooked into the fucking hype and everything. And it was supposed to be the same as the preeminent launch of Red Dead 2. It was supposed to be the cherry on top of a generation of gaming I grew up on. And what I got for my $60 
was a butt naked fucking Gary's Mod character T posing, clipping through the top of my car and showing me his asshole. The first five to six hours of Cyberpunk, essentially the entire prologue, was ensnaring to say the very least. I think the fact that the prologue was used for like 90% of the advertising and promotional material has something to do with this because this was by far the least buggy chunk of the game that I experienced, which also lends itself to the storytelling in a huge way. During the short window of acceptably optimized gameplay, one of the first things that gripped me was the combat. It was so fucking punchy, there was so much weight behind the bullets, especially the pistols, holy fuck, I don't know why, but I'm such a dirty little smirking purple devil emoji for games with solid handguns. Combat feels good, it, it feels real good, but you know what doesn't feel real good? The combat. When it's fucking absolutely neutered by the shitty, terrible, dumbass enemy AI. The enemies in Cyberpunk have three moods, and only three, and this is very important for the next section of the video, so listen up. The first and most frequent is covering fire. The enemies, for the most part, just, just take cover and blind fire. They don't react to what you're doing or attempting to do at all. They, they take cover and they shoot. There's never really a strategy. They aren't laying down covering fire for a point, man. They're not getting brave and charging you. They don't try and nade you out. They're basically roadblocks with stationary machine guns. So real quick, let's do a live narration and test it. This is a cover guy. He's shooting me, not doing any damage. I kill him. Walk up, cover guy. Shooting me, not doing any damage. I kill him. His head's apparently made of cum. I walk up to this one. They're not in cover. They can do damage. Not much at all if you look at the top, but at least they did some. Second mood is sicko mood. After a while of cover fire mode, the game throws you a curveball, and an enemy turns, points, and fucking lasers you down to about 10% health, forcing you to retreat, take cover, and reassess or, you know, use your absolutely fucking bottomless pit of imbalanced health stims that can heal faster than damage can be dealt. Those two contrasting moods for the AI are the only attempt that Cyberpunk makes to self-regulate its combat. And it's not unique to Cyberpunk. Every poorly optimized or rushed game does the same thing to balance its combat because the AI just simply isn't efficient enough to be able to keep up with combat scenarios. The third and final mood makes playing Cyberpunk feel like a fucking war crime. This one doesn't happen as frequently, but it absolutely pops up at least once in every big encounter. And this mode is... It's, it's, it's seppuku. The AI gives up, realizes the devs forgot to give it a frontal cortex, and knows its only purpose is to serve as fodder to placate gamers' bloodlust. And they literally just run up to you or out in the open, refuse to shoot, and commit seppuku via the barrel of your gun. And I've played games with combat like this before. They're not one in a million. They're pretty commonplace. And I've enjoyed them, and I do enjoy Cyberpunk, and the combat is fun enough. But the disservice that it did to all the shit that it does so well, like the gunplay, the animation, the sound design, the, the body dismemberment and the, and the gore, the body modification mechanics that really like change the gameplay and make it a lot more fruitful to just like throw that all to the side because you made such bad AI, just realizing what I had probably missed out on is just so hard to grapple with. And it's frustrating to grapple with saving up for 15 hours of gameplay to get the Mantis Blades that I was on another level of hype for, only to quickly realize they have one kill animation. They do one thing. One thing that is constantly bugging and broken, and one thing that constantly happens without my input, and always happens if I use a charge attack. Why is there absolutely no physics to the melee combat in general? Why is it all animation base with a disgusting level of magnetism. Why can I double jump with my super legs while someone is trying to punch me and they can be dragged along because the animation says so? And why in a game that came out in December of 2020 that made claims of wanting to redefine a genre that took seven years and 350 million dollars to make, am I stuck in an all too familiar force combat scenario where I've been disarmed for the mission and I have no choice but to punch a fat fucking douchebag with a gun until he dies. No choice to disarm, restrain, steal the gun for myself, pick up an object in the room, I just punch someone to death with a gun who only feels like using it every few seconds for some weird reason. But yeah, I mean, it's good enough, it, it's normal, it's tolerable, it's familiar, but it could have been X if it had just done Y. And I think that's the equation that could solve all my problems with Cyberpunk. They could have made a game that lived up to the hundred million dollars of money they spent on marketing it alone. They probably could have made a game that was a cornerstone of a generation and 
that could redefine a genre. But instead, the game's just good enough, and, and the devs were worked to the absolute bone with absolutely no timeline of when the game was actually coming out, only finding out about delays at the same time that the public did. And all the while, knowing that they have a fan base waiting for them that, that loves them in their prior work, that is incredibly hyped and every day being spurred on even farther by disingenuous marketing. Poor, underhanded management and the greed pangs of the people at the very top of a company who don't know anything about games or gamers. They are the ones to blame for this, not the, the developers, the creators, the artists, the people that brought the game to life or tried their best to. There's a reason we can all feel where the game's trying to go, what it's trying to show us, how it's trying to deliver it to us, even though it isn't there. And that's because the skill and the ability was, but the time was not. And at a company, time is a fucking synonym for money. What the leaders of CD Projekt Red did, especially like the marketing, publishing, and finance departments, what they all did is comically ironic. In a game about the suffering and shortcomings of post-capitalistic wealth inequality and socio-political corporate influence, you took government subsidies to build a game. A game that's development is characterized by the mismanagement of your time and money. You broke your own policies to throw your devs at the grindstone to fix the problem. You genuinely misled and lied through your teeth straight to your fans' faces and then gave up when it seemed the bill was getting too big. But still, you made your money hand over fucking fist and you only addressed the shitstorm you you created five days afterwards because your stock price plummeted on open on Monday morning and you had an investor's call to host. Cyberpunk and the state of CDPR right now are, are a testament to an all too familiar cancerous cycle of most our artistic industry. At some point an artist loses control of their art or hands it over for the sake of future intention and growth and at that point the power shrinks to a small group of people at the top whose only job, purpose, and knowledge is how to fucking pull pull some strings and make money float to the top and stay there. And they're good at it. They're good at money. They're good at investors. They're good at building some capital. And they're great at making sure everyone below them works harder than they do. And in the end, their financial knowledge gives them the power to make final decisions on shit they don't know dick all about. And when the money train seizes up a little bit, they, they, they cut their losses, weigh their options, do some risk management, and figure out the most efficient way against the better judgment of everybody else to make sure the money gets back up to the top. Greed was cyberpunk's enemy and homegrown hype was its own satirical dagger. And that might have sounded like the, the end of the video there, like I was wrapping up my feelings and making my big point, and I, I kind of was, but also I'm just a dramatic little slut, and uh, we still need to talk about questing and main story arcs and the settings and the characters and stuff, which I'm going to try to be quick with, but uh, you know, it, it deserves a spotlight and some scrutiny just as much as any of the other stuff we talked about does. So uh, let's do it. <laughs> CDPR side quests outshine main story arcs from other games. That's a sentiment that I've heard from more than a few people more than a few times. To someone who literally lives to be coddled and nurtured by stories and characters far more interesting than anything I could ever procure from my anxiety riddled existence, that kind of sentiment from gamers and gamets that I trust gets me real freaking excited. However, now that I've played the game and wrote about it and then beat it, wrote about it some more, then decided what the heck, I'm gonna beat it a second time and wrote about it some more. My reaction to the game and its stories and its characters is eerily similar to uh, Amos Diggory's reaction to his dead son. Because like Amos is struggling with the idea that his beautiful Baki vampire son is on his way to platform dead, dead, and deady, I'm grappling with the fact that one of my favorite narrative experiences in the history of video games is not going to be consumed by nearly the amount of people that it should because the people that are making it are catching constant Avada Kedavras to the back of the dome by their own bosses, and at the same time, they're being lambasted by millions of people named Kyle and Nick on Reddit. Now, I've been playing video games for a long time, and I have a severely dented chimpanzee brain, so this, you know, this might not actually be one of the best iterations of storytelling I've ever experienced, but, you know, I got new stimuli brain. <laughs> you could probably start talking about a game from a decade ago right now, and I'd agree with you, because I'm a little drunk. You know, 
probably even games that I care about way more than Cyberpunk, like Halo 3 or Fallout New Vegas. But honestly, I played those games a lot of times, and by Halo 3, I don't know what the hell is going on in the Halo storyline, and I don't give a shit about Cortana anymore, because anytime she shows up in a narrative purpose, my legs stop working, and I hate it. And at this point, whenever I play Fallout New Vegas, I just speed run my way to the strip and sell all the snow globes I have to Mr. House before I infiltrate his little bunker and commit Bellatrix Lestrange on his Dobby looking ass. That new stimuli relationship kind of applies to characters too, like I adore Marcus from Borderlands, but what the fuck, I have Victor now. And like Nick Valentine, he is sick, but if he's sick, then Takamura is probably, I don't know, terminally ill. I mean, even Kella Brimbor from the Shadow Of series, I'm sorry man, but if I need a schizophrenic, omnipotent brain parasite to work with all game, I'm picking Keanu Reeves, and I say Keanu Reeves and not Johnny Silverhand because honestly, I kind of have the feeling at this point that if Johnny Silverhand wasn't played by Keanu Reeves, an infallible human being, he'd be kind of cringe. And I don't even know a romanceable character from any other game that's worthy of mention next to Pan Am. Pan Am is written for and performed for so fucking well, and genuinely, 100% of the people I know IRL that have played Cyberpunk and beat it picked Pan Am's ending. Because she's a fucking badass and her story is so compelling. And also because of the car set. Seriously though, the collective love the community found for the character Pan Am isn't actually defined by her being an attractive cluster of high fidelity pixels. It's defined by the compelling dynamism of her story and the integrity of her motives and the idiosyncrasy of her attitude and way of life compared to almost everywhere and everyone else in the game. The huge desert chunk of the map solely exists for Pan Am's story arc and every time I get a call from Pan Am, I'm absolutely giddy to escape the clutches of Night City and see what hijinks the all the tacos have gotten into this time. Pan Am's missions are distinctly slower paced, more purposefully thought through, and designed around collaboration and sometimes companionship. They perfectly highlight the aspects of cyberpunk that, through all of the shortcomings and bold-faced lies, still manage to elevate this title to an exclusive stratum of video games. What I also love about Pan Am's story arc was the Altocados clan relationship toward me evolving from reservation to curiosity to desperation to acceptance to inclusion. It felt so genuinely compelling and natural, and thanks in part to the writing and performance of the characters for sure, but also the uniquely distinct pacing mechanic that Cyberpunk all but runs its entire game through. The character or cell phone in Cyberpunk isn't perfect, you know, it picks up dozens of calls at once, calls people right in front of me that I'm talking to, or refuses to let me ignore calls or hang up on them sometimes. No, I don't want to answer. I didn't I won't pretend to know exactly how it works or how it interfaces directly with the questing, but I personally was taken aback by how compelling I found the, the way and the time it delivers your, your quest to you and, and the way it keeps you moving forward on all of these different like branching uh, like main storylines and alt main storylines all at once and how it kept me really excited to get phone calls from people like Victor and Pan Am and Judy and Takamura. And when you pick up that phone, you genuinely never knew like what was waiting for you on the other side of it. The emotional extremes this game coerces you into experiencing, it's astounding. I mean, when I got a phone call that led me out to a cottage next to a lake to meet up with Judy, I was taken aback by the melancholic tranquility of exploring the sunken ruins of her childhood together, a, a patent juxtaposition to any other narrative experience in the game. And just a day before that, I was floored by the, the abject disgust and anger I felt while helping River rescue his nephew from a deranged predator's slaughter Farm. The game even gave me a real life kind of satisfaction and memory I'll never forget. When Takamura calls you to help him ambush the parade, it's a mission we've been building toward almost the entire game, and it's shaping up to be a real fun one. A bunch of shit I won't spoil happens because it's a dope mission, and then things go awry and Takamura and V are sent plunging into certain death. But you survive, and you wake up, and Takamura is nowhere to be found and isn't you know, hinted at being around at all, and you're surrounded by legions of high level enemies with one objective, leave the building. But I felt this familiar pull to try and do something to find and help Takamura. It's a, it's a feeling I feel in almost every game I play at some point, to make sure the rules are rules, make sure what seems scripted really is, and it always fucking is. But Takamura is dope and I gotta see what I can see. So I try to make it upstairs where we last were, I don't know if he fell through the floor with me. I blow past the objective that is to get out of the building, that door that would lead me out and take me away from all of these enemies, and I hear Taki scream on my way up. So I charge up there after that 
scream. I fight off another legion of enemies. I save his life and alter the future of the game. And afterwards, I talked to some friends and realized none of them had done this or thought to try to. And after I realized that, after I realized I had affected my game in such a substantial way, I had to take a break for the rest of the day because of how astounded I was. A fool's errand that I've undertaken since I was a child. I mean, this shit dates back to trying to save all the marines in Halo CE or trying to line up my shot in COD 4 so it would actually dome Zakaev. That fool's errand finally came to fruition. I can't say enough how thankful I am for that agency. And at the very end of the game, my painfully slow descent from hopeful excitement to sobering anxiety when I realized that no matter what I did or chose to do next, in the end, Johnny and I were both damned to some cruel form of purgatory, forever grappling with how the choice that we made there would affect the other. It was a, a beautiful and harsh and almost overwhelming choice, one that I wasn't ready to make and that I was honestly scared to make because games don't usually do that. They don't pull you in and attach themselves to you and deliver you such a visceral experience with so many poignant characters layered throughout only to subvert your expectation of, of, of it all going right in the end and you being the hero and solving everybody's problems and just deliver you on the doorstep of that decision face to face with, with reality. But this one does. Cyberpunk 2077 feels like one of the most important stories I've ever dropped myself into. It's exhilarating, unsettling, fun, challenging, emotional, comical, exciting, depressing, liberating, oppressing, sexual, gory, immersive. Whatever the fuck the opposite of immersive is, it's human. The stories and its characters are about as human as I've ever had the pleasure of experiencing in a video game, and all set in a world that seemed foreign to me, but over time I realized it was anything but. I saw the foundations of the human experience masked under a layer of hyperbole. At some point, Cyberpunk 2077 started reminding me of Game of Thrones. The feelings that the fucking show and the game both gave me, but also their dynamics in a weirdly opposite but equal way. Regardless of their, their setting or what's going on in that world, at the foundation they're trying to tell us a story of, of life and human nature persisting through anything. And at the same time they're trying to show us the repercussions of that, whether they be negative or positive. And also they, they both show us titty but no vagine. Why? Cyberpunk 2077 is at its absolute best when it's bringing you along on a carefully conceived plotted story arc. And that's a direct result of the game being spread too thin. Like I said in my freedom doesn't equal fun video, more isn't always better, especially in video games. A lot of people and, and fans, including myself, forget that creating games, especially on this AAA modern scale, is an incredibly arduous and precise process for the artists. And devs say it's even a miracle that games hit the shelves to begin with. But CDPR didn't need to give us the kitchen sink and certainly didn't need to perpetuate the idea of one, knowing full well it wasn't possible. But not only was this shortcoming the result of greed, mismanagement, and overzealous ambition, more than any of that, it was a shortcoming and failure of the modern publishing industry. Since the days of Cookie Monster snapbacks and I Heart Boobies bracelets, it's been all too common for AAA studios to deliver us unfinished and imbalanced products. Publishers can publish games without even a second thought for the consumer, and not only can they placate their audience away with, with, with the guilt of you know the devs having to undergo so much crunch for goals that they underestimated and crunch that they instituted, but they can literally be more profitable because of the game's now elongated roadmap and almost uh, like expectation of a second release in the near future, and, and, and have a huge influx of cash while they're continuing and ramping down the end of development. And if you, you don't think so, you're a fool because we all know these companies make their decisions first and foremost with money in mind. And if this wasn't economically viable, they would have stopped it a decade ago. I came at Cyberpunk thinking that the most pro-consumer publisher, which isn't saying much, was making a game about the woes of unregulated capitalism and the unabashed anti-consumer practice of corporations. I thought I'd be able to take on the man in the establishment and suck on some cyber goth girl shock nipples in VR while in VR. But little did I know that taking on the man actually meant getting face fucked by CDPR's newfound anti-consumer cock. The game at its core is a one-of-a-kind outstanding story worthy of your time in spite of all the bullshit surrounding it. But you have to know going into it, it isn't what they promised and it doesn't need to be. The cops are in the game to prevent you from going off track, not to facilitate gameplay. The combat generally serves 
serves as a vehicle to keep you moving forward through the story, not a conduit for fun, and once the game is over, there's very little worthwhile combat left to experience. The lifestyle you choose at the beginning has next to no bearing on a single mission, experience, or ending. The side quests are as straightforward as they come and rarely leave room for improvisation. The gigs are reminiscent of the odd jobs in Spider-Man 2 for GameCube. The customization's so lackluster you can't even give your car a paint job. And CD Projekt Red's actions in contrast to the subject matter of the game is basically the best satire in the history of the world. Nonetheless, Cyberpunk 2077 is a game that I'm grateful I've gotten to experience a couple times, and, and its story is a testament to the things we all know that CDPR is the best in the industry at. And after all this, I hope they learn to embrace and reinvigorate those roots because there's nothing wrong with them and they run fucking deep. Thank you very much for watching this video. I don't even know how long it is at this point, and I don't even know how long it's taken at this point, but right now, sitting at the end of February, I am terrified of how long I've been gone and who's even left on the channel, and I don't know. To, to those of you who've stuck around, I fucking love you. Thank you. And to anybody who made it to this point and is still listening that isn't subscribed or is totally new, welcome. Again, thank you very much for watching. Please, please check out my new podcast with some of my favorite boys I've ever met online. It's called Beef Boys. It comes out Wednesday, April 7th at 12.30 p.m. EST. On all audio platforms you listen to podcasts on and the video version on YouTube. Link in the description. The obligatory please follow me on Twitter, if not only for the sole purpose of my own ego. And for anybody still here that made it all the way to the end, thank you and I want to play you a little something I wrote about my experience with Cyber Cyberpunk 2077. Here we go. <sighs> the doctors thought they stole my wisdom, but I just thought of something. City Project Red as a publisher or a mirror of the things they're trying to satirize in the game.